All right. Pastor confession time. You guys love pastor confession time. Yeah. I love the UFC. <laughs> Some of you are like, UFC, is that like Uganda fried chicken? No, it's, it's the ultimate fighting championship. It's a sport. Um, and I struggle sometimes as a Christian, as a pastor, because it's a pretty brutal and violent sport. And uh, I'm like, Lord, is this okay? And he hasn't convicted me yet, so I'm still... <laughs> I'm still enjoying it. If it's not for you, hey, you gotta, that's between you and him. But the, the reason why I like the UFC is not because I love seeing guys get their face beaten, which is kind of part of the entertainment. But the real reason why I enjoy watching the UFC cage fighting is because I don't, I don't think there's any, more, there's any sport that is more competitive or more athletic or more dominant than that sport. I'll give you an example. If I was in like fifth grade and I like hit a jumper on the basketball court against one of my friends, uh, it's, he, like he's, he's not gonna come back and be like, well, I'm gonna come and score a goal on you in soccer. Like that's not how you want up one another, right? It's like you either get beat down, right? Once, once you get beat down by another person, I mean, there's no coming back from that. Like they've just exercised their absolute dominance over you. And so there's this element of like, when you, when you try to put two people against each other, by their will, by the way, so not like gladiators who are forced against, to, to fight against each other, but people who are saying, you know what, this is my sport, I'm competitive in this, and as long as they're willing, I'm willing, we're gonna see who, who wins this thing. I just think, man, that, that's, that's powerful. It's, it's a really, and there's such an art to it, and there's such a discipline to it. One of the things that's so amazing about it is, the amount of like dietary discipline and like cutting weight. Anyone here ever had to cut weight? Some of you have been cutting weight through this prayer and fasting deal, which ends yesterday or today. So that's exciting if anyone's like super hungry. But <laughs> has anyone here ever done that? Like wrestling or anything we had to cut weight? Yeah, it's hard, right? It is not fun. I remember I was in uh, high school. I wrestled for a little bit and I was at 172 and my coach called me two days before a tournament, and he was like, hey, our 162 guy actually can't uh, wrestle on Friday, so we need you to drop to 162 in two days. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I didn't know better, so I did. I starved myself, and I didn't drink water, and then I got to the tournament, and I was like literally on my back the whole time, so it was kind of a waste, but it's hard. It's hard, and it takes discipline, and it takes self-sacrifice. Yeah. One thing that I like about uh, watching this sport, too, is especially, like, in the championships, they have, like, five rounds versus three rounds, five five-minute rounds. And if you've ever wrestled before, you know that, like, you can train for hours and hours and hours, and then once you get on the mat, it's, like, the worst six minutes of your life. I don't know how. It's just all of that just does not even compare to the density of athleticism and intensity that happens within a six-minute uh, you know, match or meet. And so in these, in these fights, though, what's, what can be really amazing is you see somebody who has their back against the wall or the cage, the fence, quite literally, and they're like from round to round, they're just, their face is swollen, they're bleeding, they're, you're like, dude, this guy or gal, women do it too. I mean, shoot, I, hey, if you're, if you're a lady into that, God bless you, that's, that's crazy. But these people are, are in these situations and they're just, they're just taking these hits and they're just surviving. Like there comes a point in some of these fights where they're literally just surviving, waiting for an opportunity for like one uppercut or one like, you know, sweeping kick or roundhouse kick or some sort of chokehold, and it's in that one opportunity. They, the whole fight, the whole fight, they could have been losing, and in one moment, they can win the entire thing. Isn't that kind of, like, think, think about the weight of that. Like, you could have your back against the ropes the entire time, and in one moment, if you can survive long enough, if you can, like, try to figure out which way is up at the right moment, if you can get yourself under control and be poised and not panic and, 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 and fall back into the disciplines of your training, all it takes is one 
on the chin. <laughs> and they're raising your hand at the end of the fight. You might be thinking, what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, I think a lot of us, if we're going to be completely honest, we're in the fight of our lives right now. For some people, that really landed because you feel it. You've never been more discouraged. You've never been more disappointed. You've never felt like God was further away. You've never felt more hopeless. You've never felt more weary. You've never felt more exhausted. For some of you, you're on week six, seven, eight of your trial, and you're like, man, this... This is crazy, but I'm sure it's, it's going to get better. And then there's other people around you who are in year three, four, five, year 20 of their trial, and they're thinking, I must be a fool for believing this thing. I must be a fool for believing that God would want to break through in my life. I, w- I must be a fool thinking that God would want to turn this thing around. Some of you, quite honestly, you could say, I'm not in a fight right now, and praise God. But here's what we say when, when we're in ministry to help, to help the body appropriately think about trial and appropriately think about spiritual warfare is that you're either in a battle, coming out of a battle, or going into a battle. Always. Until we get to glory, right? Until we see Jesus face to face and there's no more pain and no more tears and we get new bodies and sickness is gone and death is gone and everything is made new. But until then, we live in enemy-occupied territory. Jesus himself said that we should not be surprised by trials. But he also said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Some of you might be familiar with the term mental health. We're in a mental health crisis as a country right now. We are the most medicated country in the history of the world. And if these, med- if these medicines really worked, you'd think we have no problems. Then how come simultaneously, while we are the most medicated country in the planet, we are also experiencing higher depression, anxiety, and suicide than ever before? I thought these things worked. And I'm not poo-pooing you know, medicine and, and, and all that sort of stuff, but we gotta ask these questions. We gotta be real. I just heard a stat the other day that said that teenagers who are on TikTok are twice as likely to commit suicide as teenagers who are not on TikTok. Someone said delete. Now, there's an opportunity to, to redeem these things and to use them for the glory of God, right? But the question that I'm asking is, do we, have a, do we have a medical problem, or is there something deeper? When we read the Bible, unfortunately, I, I, just, I see the pattern. I'm not trying to knock on churches, but there's, there's a lot of churches out there that have drifted away from the purpose of the Scripture. And this book, let me tell you guys, this is not a self-help guide. This is not for therapeutic purposes. This is for supernatural purposes, I would say that we don't just have a mental health crisis, we have a soul health crisis. But the world doesn't have language for that. We can't easily study that. Is it measurable? I would say so. But it's not as easy to measure on a spreadsheet. But I believe that if we can get to the heart of why is this happening in our culture? Why is this happening in me? We'll be able to win this war. We see in the book of Job, Job starts out with a very interesting picture. The book starts out with Satan. Someone say Satan. He's the devil. He's the adversary of our souls. He's not a myth. He's not uh, some mythological figure. He's not a, a, a parable. He's a real spiritual entity that roams the earth like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And the book begins with with Satan approaching God and saying, God, I'm I'm roaming the earth looking for someone to take over, looking for someone to dominate. I can't find anyone. And then God says, have you tried Job? Now, who's Job? Job is not some knucklehead. 
Job is not some unrighteous guy. In fact, it says that Job was a righteous man. Job was a prosperous man. Job feared God. He taught his family to fear God. He even would intercede for his kids. When his kids would go out and possibly while out, Job stayed home and would intercede for his children for their welfare, asking God to protect them from whatever they might have reaped upon themselves. Job was a righteous man. So, so, So rewind it real quick. So God says to Satan, Have you tested Job? Have you tried Job? Satan then says to God, well, the only reason that he worships you is because you've blessed him with all this stuff. You see, Job was the richest man in his town. He had had everything going. Everything was going right, right? And as we read the Bible and we look at Proverbs and we see that there is a formula to a certain extent to how if we do the right thing, good things will happen. We will reap what we So Job kind of cracked the code. He's, he knows what to sow, and he has reaped what he has sowed. But God says to Satan, I bet you that if you test Job, he still won't curse me to my face. And then Satan said, bet. Satan goes, and he afflicts Job. Takes all of his stuff, takes all of his wealth, kills his kids. And then he takes away Job's health. Some of you have been going through, we just prayed for this, but some of you have been going through the biggest health trial of your life. We've been experiencing that in our home a little bit in this season, and it's, it's, it's so, man, I don't think there's a trial worse than a health trial, honestly. There's a saying that says, a man has a thousand wishes, but a sick man has one. When your own body becomes your enemy, to prison. And Job experiences this in this moment. And through the rest of the book of Job, what we see is this kind of this, this argument between him and his friends. And his friends first came alongside and they were, they were there to comfort him. They were there to sit with him. They were there to empathize with him. If you remember from PT's message about um, he, he, his first two messages, the, the worst day of my life and my friend's worst day of their life or something like that. Forgive me, PT, if I, if I butchered the title of that. But the idea was, how do we respond to trial, and how do we respond to other people going through trial? And in the middle of everything going on, Job's friends begin to give him some really whack counsel. In fact, they start accusing Job and telling Job, hey, you must have done something wrong. What sin did you commit in order for this to occur to you? Can you imagine Can you imagine going through this? Maybe some of this this has actually happened to some of you, where you're going through the most horrific season of your life, and what you need is for somebody not to preach at you, but to love you and to come alongside you, and now these people are accusing you. Church, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, here's a quick nugget for us. Let's be slow to speak. Let's be slow to speak and quick to listen when someone else is going through a trial. It's so easy when we're not in the thick of it to give our advice, to give our prescriptions, to say, hey, well, this is what, this is what worked for me. And I'm not saying that can't be helpful, but let's just make sure that's an invited first, that we're not just sharing it because we feel like we don't know. It's, the silence is too deafening. Sometimes the silence is medicinal and healing, and we should sit there. But what we see particularly in this chapter of chapter Job 19 is we see Job in the fight of his life. We see Job with his back against the wall. We see Job feeling like, man, I I don't know if I can do this anymore. Job is surviving in this situation. And you might be wondering, why would a good God allow Job, who's a righteous man, to go through something like this? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There's a term called representative warfare. And in representative warfare, it's when you have one army versus another army, and when you have like maybe thousands of soldiers on each side, but both armies decide we're gonna have one person represent each army, and then we're gonna have them duke it out against each other. 
A great picture of this is David and Goliath, right? David and Goliath, it's not like David just walked up to some random guy named Goliath and they decided to kill him. There was, G- Goliath was a part of this army called the Philistines, and there were all of these Philistines camping out, and Goliath was, was the representative of the Philistines, and he was strutting back and forth, taunting the Israelites. And the Israelites were, wait, were, were looking at each other like, who would dare to go against this guy? Who can be our representative? And those who have been reading the Bible for a little while, you know that David, a shepherd boy, empowered by the Holy Spirit, comes up to the scene and and says, who does this guy think he is defying my God? He steps up into the battle, tries to put on Saul's armor, and he's like, no, this doesn't fit me. I'm just going to take my sling and my rocks. He takes these rocks, and he's like... And the rock goes right into Goliath's head. Goliath falls over. David comes over, cuts off his head. This is the Bible, man. I love it. You see, like, now you're, making, you're, you're judging me for liking UFC, and we're seeing the UFC happen right in the Bible right here. He cuts off Goliath's head. He holds up his head as a, as a symbol of victory that he has overcome. I would, I would go as far to say that what we're seeing happen right now between Job and Satan is not God just saying, yeah, let's just chalk up Job. Let's just see what happens. Like he's some emperor and he's throwing a gladiator into the ring. No, what I believe God is doing in this moment is he's betting on Job. There's a, it's a different story. It's a different story when God looks at your life and says, this person can handle this test. This person is qualified. This person has slain the the lion and the bear in the secret place, and I'm going to put this person up front on the front lines to make a spectacle of the enemy. Could your infirmity, could your trial, could your bout with a spirit of fear or depression be a backhanded compliment? You guys are quiet. Could it be a backhanded compliment that God looks at you and says, none other than this person can prove to Satan himself that I am worth worshiping? Job is in this scenario right now, but the fight is not looking good. And we're going to read this. I'm just going to read as much scripture as possible right now because this is... Uh, This is a really powerful chapter. Job 19, it says, Then Job spoke again, How long will you torture me? How long will you try to crush me with your words? You've already insulted me ten times. He's talking to his friends here. You should be ashamed of treating me so badly. Even if I have sinned, that is my concern, not yours. You think you're better than I am, using my humiliation as evidence of my sin. This is where it gets bad, y'all. I want you to focus on this. Pay attention to this. This This is what comes out of Job's heart in this moment. He says, but it is God who has wronged me, capturing me in his net. I cry out help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way so I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. I thought he was the God of hope. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. He's still talking about God. He's not even talking about Satan. They build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. My relatives stay far away, and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone, and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. Hello, don't nudge your neighbor. (laughs) I'm rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me. Must you also persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? We just went through an amazing message last week from Pastor Todd called Let It Out. Let me tell you, if you're going through a trial right now, make sure you go listen to that message because it's so important for us to recognize that God can handle word vomit. 
He wants us to get the junk out of our heart because if it stays there, it will infect us at every core level of our being, even physically. Science would show that what's happening mentally and spiritually within us actually can manifest uh, physically in our bodies, and it's biblical too. God wants us to pour it out to him. He can carry it. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what's in our hearts. But the difference between pouring it out to the Lord and what we see Job doing right now is Job has turned his direction of complaint from the Lord to himself. He's sulking. That's point number one. The title of this message, I forgot to say it, is Winning the War in Your Mind. And if we want to win the war in our minds, it's going to require a tool called sacrificial praise. We'll get to that in a second. But first, we have to identify and ask the hard question. Am I honestly pouring out my heart to God? Am I, am I casting my cares upon him? Or am I in a cycle of sulking? There's a big difference. I'm not saying fake putting on a smile. I'm just saying that we got to recognize that when it says in John 10:10 10, 10, that the enemy has come to kill, steal and destroy, but God has bring has come to bring life. Jesus came to bring life and life abundantly. Here's what happens. I've seen it all the time. I felt it myself. Here's what's crazy about the enemy. He not only attacks us and robs us and tries to destroy us, but then he tries to deceive us. And then tries to blame us and blame God. It's so manipulative. And he's been doing it since the beginning of time. Garden of Eve. Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Remember? When Satan the serpent comes to Eve and he, and, and he says, what did God tell you? And Eve says, he, God told us not to eat or touch of the, tree of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good or evil or else we will die. And then Satan says, you won't surely die. God just doesn't want you to become like him. God's holding out on you. He's been the father of lies since the beginning. And he is winning the fight against you and your soul. Your back is against the fence. Not just because your circumstance has been unimaginable, but he has got you to the place where you don't even know which way is up. And the one who can actually deliver you from this thing, the one who wants to be with you in this thing, all of a sudden he's painted as the enemy. This is what happens when we sulk for too long. Are you in a season and a cycle of sulking? Job goes on to say this. This is what's amazing because when he's in this cycle of sulking, there's nothing worse than going through a trial. I mean, we go through trials through life, right? But I'll tell you this. There's nothing, more, there's nothing worse than going through a trial as a Christian and thinking that God isn't in it, and God doesn't see you. Sometimes you can go through the worst trial of your life, and you're just like, God, if you could just give me a word, just give me a word, because by, from, I, I don't live by bread alone. I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, and if you just give me a word, just to give me clarity, just to help me understand, just to give me hope, it would change everything. But what happens when you feel like he's silent? What if God's just working in the background? What if, God, what if what we just sang is true? That even when we don't see him working or feel him working, he's always working in the background. Check this out. Job 19, verse 23. He goes on to say this. It's like he's in this, he's in this funk. He's in this cycle of sulking. And then he says, oh, that my words could be recorded. Oh, that they could be inscribed on a monument, carved with an iron chisel and filled with lead, engraved forever in the rock. Isn't that kind of ironic? Because here we are, reading the very words. He's in this moment, and you know what I really think he's crying out? I think he's crying out, and he's saying, God, do you see any of this? Will any of this be remembered? Are you overlooking this? Or are you seeing this? Do you care? Will, this e will my suffering mean any eternal significance? And God's looking at him in this moment. And can you imagine can you imagine? Can you imagine when Job steps into eternity and God shows him this book? And he's like, bro, remember? I was there the whole time. 
I'm El Roy. I'm the God who sees. I'm the God who sees you who's struggling with in infertility. I'm the God who sees you as you can't, you can't sleep at night. I see you. I care. And I bottle up every tear. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's like in this moment, perhaps, Job just kind of, he pauses and he reflects. And all of a sudden, something changes. Verse 25, he says, but. We talk about this a lot in church. When there's a but in the Bible, it's usually a really good thing. But I want to submit to you that when Job goes from sulking to contemplating to saying this one word, something dies in him in this moment. This is the second point. If we want to move, if we want to win the war in our minds, and we want to win the war in our, in our hearts, if we want to win this representative warfare against the enemy in these days, as he's trying to accuse us, as he's trying to throw shade on us, as he's trying to get us to accuse and curse God, we have to come to a place of sacrifice. And Job, in this moment, he makes a decision to die to his own understanding. Oh, come on, somebody. We just sang it. God, give me a peace that surpasses understanding. Oh, boy. When you get a peace that surpasses understanding, here's what's kind of crazy about it. You don't understand it. You don't understand why. It's not because your ducks are lined up. It's not because everything's going your way. But it's so supernatural, and the Bible says that it rules, it takes umpire in our hearts and guards us. The only way that we get there is if we die to our right to understand. God, I don't know why I'm going through this trial. Nothing wrong with asking for clarity. Nothing wrong for asking for wisdom. But if you're not getting it, you, for you and me, maybe God is saying, would you just die to the right to understand everything and trust me? It's a sacrifice. And a sacrifice is super painful. I want to read, um, shoot, I, I, I'm running out of time. I want to make sure that I get... Oh, Lord, help me wrap this up as quickly as possible while still bringing something meaningful. Let me just finish what Job says here. He says, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand up upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body, I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. Pause right there. You see, what happened? Did his circumstance change? Did his feelings change? No, he made a sacrifice. And you and I cannot make a sacrifice out of how we feel, but out of what we know. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. If a sacrifice was up to my feelings, here's a great picture for you. Between the difference, the difference between an offering and a sacrifice. It's a story about a chicken and a pig. <laughs> a chicken and a pig were on their way to worship God. They were on their way to church. And the chicken says, let's go give God a gift. And the chicken says, hey, pig, I'm going to give God some of my eggs. You should give God some bacon. <laughs> and the pig shook his head. And he's like, bro, you're getting away with giving God an offering. You're telling me to give God a sacrifice. We don't, our nature doesn't want us to sacrifice. But when we've died to ourselves and have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer us who live, but him who lives in us and all things have passed away, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new and we're a new creation. We are living sacrifices. And God calls Job in this moment to give a living sacrifice based off of what we know, what he knows. How do we do the same? Here's what we know. You can write this down. We know, not that we feel it at times, but we know that he's sovereign, which means he's in control, he sees it all, he's good, and he's love. 
One thing that one practical tip that I've used in counseling people who go through really difficult times or even re- reading very difficult areas of scripture, like this doesn't seem like it lines up with the character of God. Why would God smoke all these people? Why does God call this a sin? We all have these questions. Here's what I would say. Start here. Start here. Start with the revelation that God is sovereign, good, and he is love, regardless of what I think. And then what we do is we say, God, reverse engineer this thing for me. I'm going to start not from where I am, but from where you are, and then help me understand, fill the gap. And God is so faithful to teach us and disciple us along the way. We're going to wrap this up with this. Here's what's amazing. When we give a sacrificial praise, when we say, God, man, oh, guys, I just, I want to, I love you all. Who had fun last week with Jonathan Trailer? Who had, yeah, I mean, it was like something was unlocked in our body when it comes to worship. But let me, can I just, can I challenge all of us and myself included? I feel like the church, the Western church treats worship so comfortably. We worship God out of our comfort. Well, I'm not comfortable raising my hands. Well, I'm not comfortable singing out loud. Or I'm not comfortable getting on my face. Can I tell you that there's people in religions all over the world that that worship false gods, and I'm not shaming them, because I used to be in that camp too until I met Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one eternal God forever to come. But there's something in us where we look at the whole world is more passionate and more devoted and has a better posture about worshiping false gods than the church of Jesus Christ does. Can we grow as a, and maturity as a church, myself included, everyone online, can we grow in saying, God, I'm not going to worship you out of my comfort. That's an offering. I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice to you. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of whether or not I think I actually believe these words, my spirit is crying out these words, whether my soul and my body agree with it or not. But when I submit to the spirit of God in me, I'm saying, soul, obey God. Body, obey God. We're going to worship God today. We're going to praise him today. And I'm telling you, when we make this sacrifice... We experience the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And there's a shift. There's a real shift. Job finishes with this. I'm overwhelmed at the thought. I'm overwhelmed at the thought. Look at me. I'm like a baby up here. But I've lived this. And I'm living this right now. And I'm not here to tell you all the stuff going on in my home and our family and all our trials. But I'm living this and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in myself. I'm seeing it in my wife. I'm seeing the power of God when you choose to give a sacrifice of praise. And I'll tell you what, dude. When you're on the fence... When you're against the ropes and you don't know which way is up and you think God's doing it to you and it's been three months now, it's been years now and it's getting worse. I'm not saying that this fixes your situation but it breaks the cycle of sulking and it shifts you into the peace of God. It is the uppercut. It is our warfare. Amen? Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would equip us to take this lesson seriously for our sake, for our family's sake, for our community's sake, for the city's sake, that we wouldn't just be fair weather worshipers, God, that we would take this sword of sacrificial praise and we would apply it today Hebrews 13, 15 says, therefore, let us offer through Jesus, not in our own strength, but by his power, Lord, a continual sacrifice of praise to God, something that costs us something, proclaiming our allegiance to him in Jesus name. Amen. As we close, anyone just like, is anyone stirred up? Everyone feel like they're equipped?
I'm telling you, yeah, you give God the praise for that. I mean, it's him, right? It's him. Here's what I would say. If you're in that situation right now, can I actually, would, would you be as bold and humble to stand up if you're in that place right now where you're like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done being in the cycle of sulking. I'm done. I'm ready. I'm ready for a shift. Come on. So good. Yes. 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 Come on. Stand up. Anybody else? Anybody in the back? Anybody over here? I'm going to lead you in a sacrifice of praise. Simple words, your heart with God. Come on, man. You're a leader. You're a leader. God's transformed you and he's transformed your family, man. Don't tap. I want you to close your eyes. Just repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my right to understand. I don't want this. I don't prefer this. I wish it would stop. I'm choosing to, to trust that even you don't want this, that you don't enjoy this. I'm choosing to trust that you are sovereign, that you are good, and that you are love. I lay down my right to understand, and I give you a sacrifice of praise. You are worthy. You are holy, you are beautiful, you are perfect. You know what's best for me. And if I'm going through this, I must need it. Get every drop of glory out of this season that you want. I bless you. I thank you, not because I'm thankful, but because you're worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a shift, man. So good. Let's all stand to our feet, actually. Let's all stand to our feet. I want to end this very quickly because I, I know we're running out of time, but I do want to give an opportunity for anybody in here who's saying, you know what? I don't know Jesus. I don't know who this God is. You might be one of the first-time guests. And you're thinking, this is different. This is different from what I thought Christianity was because I thought Christianity was you worship God to get all of your ducks in a row and to get everything going perfectly in your life. And let me tell you, that's, <laughs> whoa, whoa, <laughs> that is so wrong. Yes, he blesses us. Yes, every good gift comes from the Father above. But Jesus told his disciples, he said, lay down your life, pick up your cross and follow me. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Because what I offer you is something that the world cannot offer you. Broad is the path that leads to destruction and many will go down that path. That destruction is hell for eternity. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven because he hates people. No, because he loves people. And he wants to be clear and he's saying, guys, you're going down the way that your flesh desires. You're going down the way that the world's telling you to go. You're following Satan down this path, but narrow is the path that leads to eternal life and few will find it. And I'm not promising you that it's gonna be easy. I'm not promising you that it's gonna be comfortable, but what I am promising you is that's gonna be worth it. And when you follow me, hey, I'll lead the way. I'll go first. Jesus, the Son of God, comes to planet Earth, lives the life that you and I can never live, sinless, blameless, never lied, never stole, never lusted, was tempted at all points like us, but did not sin. The perfect sacrifice for our sin, you and me were sinful people before a, a, a holy and just judge, and we stand before him on judgment day, apart from somebody paying our bill, we're paying that bill. And the wages of our sin is death in this life and the life to come. But God looked upon sinners like you and me and he said, no, -uh, I don't want this. I created these people for relationship. Son, will you go down and rescue these people? Yes, Father. Jesus comes to planet Earth, is crucified on a cross, being mocked by the very people that he came to save. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He breathed his last breath and said, it is finished to tell us I on that cross, paying the debt in full. Buried in a tomb, three days later, cracks that tomb by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Proving once and for all that he's not comparable to Muhammad or Buddha or Gandhi or Confucius. He is the one true God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And he says, all you got to do, here's the keys to eternal life. Jingle, 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 jingle. Here's what you got to do. All you got to do is believe. It's to make a sacrifice, not of your flesh, but of your mind. To say, God, I'm not going down this cycle anymore. I'm turning to praise you. I'm going to make a, sac a living sacrifice in this moment to say, God, I don't fully understand. It's not logical. The love of God is not logical. Praise God that it's not logical. Because logical love is conditional. This, this love is unconditional. I don't care if you had an abortion. I don't care if you're a murderer. I don't care if you walked out on your wife. I don't care if you're on drugs right now. God, sober up minds in this house if someone's on drugs in this place. I don't care. There's an open seat at the table for you. If you would be willing to surrender yourself and say, God, I put my trust in you. I turn from my selfish ways. I'm picking up my cross and I'm following you today. He's going to give you grace to do that. If that's you, I want to invite you up at the front. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Simple prayer of confessing and receiving. The band's going to play this song in the background, going to give you a moment to come down. If that's you, come down boldly. Jesus died a public death for you. He wants a public confession from all of us. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray in this moment. So Ben, take it away. If that's you, please come forward. There is none like you. And no one else can touch my heart like you do. Oh, I could search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you. Oh, there is none like you. No one else, no one else can touch my heart like you do. Search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you. Just so you know, I, I don't prolong this so that I look like, oh man, like no one came forward. That was a flop. No, I want to give you an opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. I want to challenge you. You're being held back by a desire for comfort. You feel like it's more comfortable to stay where you're standing and to not respond to the Holy Spirit of God as he's calling you forward. He's a good father. He wants to adopt you back into his family. Let me just ask you this. Where has comfort got you in your life? Where has living comfortable got you? Jesus is inviting us into something that, yes, it's uncomfortable, but he gives us the Holy Spirit who is the comforter who leads us and guides us and ministers to us as we follow him. I want to give you just one more opportunity. If there's anybody in this house who's saying, I don't understand fully, but I know I got to respond to the call of God. Come forward. Anybody? Anybody? Lord, I just ask in the name of Jesus. In a room this size, can't everyone be saved? But you know where they're at. You know who's watching online. And Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus for you to speak from heaven in a way that only you can speak. Speak to the person online. Speak to the person in the house who's saying, I need some evidence of, of, that God is real in my life, that God sees me, that I'm not just an NPC in this video game, but I'm an actual character that God cares about. God, I pray that you would minister to that person and speak to the language of their heart this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Let's grow in giving sacrificial praise this week, amen. Have a great week. Yeah. Wow, Kappa, thank you.